And here we go. All right, awesome. Um, so my name is Dennis Kleban, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about Pulp Operator and how uh, you can leverage some features of it and Kubernetes to uh, achieve some of your high availability goals. Um, so today we're going to first kind of uh, discuss what we mean by high availability. Um, then we're going to take a look at the architecture of Pulp. Uh, we're going to look at what Pulp Operator can and cannot do for you. Um, and then I'll do a little demo of uh, how to scale Pulp across multiple Kubernetes nodes to avoid disruptions. So what is high availability? Um, if you ask 10 different people about what they consider to be a highly available service, you may likely get 10 different answers. Um, and that's because even the same piece of software deployed in two different organizations can have uh, different needs from their users. So uh, we should talk about setting service level objectives and how uh, those objectives can be measured uh, using service level indicators. Um, some uh, two examples of such indicators are response codes, like 200 OKs and 404s, and response times, the latency. Um, and using those metrics, those indicators, you could set a service level objective for any particular service of, for example, serving only 200s, 404s, and 403s uh, in under 500 milliseconds, 99.99% of the time. Um, and that's, you know, a very concrete objective that you could work towards. Um, so let's take a look at Pulp's architecture to see what we need to consider whenever we are deploying Pulp um, so that we're uh, more tolerant of disruptions. Um, in the blue here are the core services uh, that Pulp uh, has. Um, on the left here, we have Pulp Core Content. This is what the clients out there uh, use to consume uh, repositories and updates. Um, and then we also have the Pulp Core API here in the middle. And that's the REST API that Pulp users use to upload content or schedule syncing of repositories. Um, and that's uh, a different set of users that uh, use that service. And then we have the Paul Core workers, which perform the asynchronous tasks, such as syncing and publishing repositories. Um, all three of these components can be uh, scaled um, horizontally. And this is uh, what the operator can uh, help you do. Um, all of these services, though, rely on other services to be available. Um, everything is uh, connected to the Postgres instance. And whenever you're deploying Pulp on Kubernetes, um, I definitely recommend not trying to run your own Postgres, but use some kind of a service like RDS on Amazon that is going to provide some resilience for you. Um, Pulp also. Uh, relies on st a storage backend. It can be a shared file system or object storage, and um, that needs to be uh, resilient to problems also. And while the operator can deploy Postgres for you and uh, it can deploy Redis for you, it does not uh, deploy those in a highly available fashion. Um, so, and then here at the top, we also have a reverse proxy um, so that requests that come into Pulp are routed to the correct service, either to the content app or to the API. Um, and so what Pulp Operator can really help you do is scale the Pulp Core uh, API, Pulp Core content, and Pulp Core workers and ensure that you have the right number of them to service your requests. 
Um, what it can't really help you do is uh, reduce the amount of time it takes for these services to service those requests. So that uh, so the demo that I'll be doing here in this a uh, bit will only demonstrate how to ensure that you can service as many requests as possible, but not as fast as possible. And so the operator does not ensure that your database is highly available. Um, you want to rely on a service that will do that for you. <laughs> and the same thing goes for the storage system um, in Redis. And so Redis is uh, a little bit tricky uh, for Pulp because we only um, allow you to talk to one instance of Redis. Um, and we don't support the cluster deployment at this time. Uh, however, if Redis does go down for Pulp, it um, degrades the service because the cache is uh, gone. However, if it, whenever it does come back, that cache does get rebuilt and it gets it's used again. So it's not as disruptive. Um, but also, the, uh, the other thing that the operator doesn't help you with is uh, ensuring that the DNS services are highly available. And we know that a lot of times when you're having <laughs> network uh, connectivity issues, it's the DNS that's the issue. Um, and so you need to ensure that you are using DNS services that are highly available. Um, and also, the reverse proxy uh, needs to be highly available, and the operator does not help with that. Um, and so let's uh, do a little demo. Um, I have uh, an OpenShift cluster deployed. It is made up of three nodes. And what I'm going to demonstrate today is how to ensure that pulp content, which is a service that I believe that needs to be you know, the most highly available. Obviously, we want the APIs available also, but today, for the simplicity of this demo, we're only going to focus on pulp content. Um, we're going to tell the operator and Kubernetes to schedule our three replicas of pulp content uh, on three different nodes. Um, and this is done by creating a pulp custom resource which is basically the API for talking to uh, the operator. And when we tell it to deploy the content app, we're going to tell it to deploy three replicas. And then we're going to uh, provide an affinity rule, which basically tells how to um, schedule the pod within Kubernetes. And we're actually going to use a pod anti-affinity rule, which is going to be preferred during scheduling, meaning that if the scheduler can uh, schedule using this rule, it's going to follow it, but it's not required. Um, this, If this keyword here was required, um, the scheduling wouldn't happen at all if the rule couldn't be met. Um, and then the second part of here is the ignore during execution means that once the pod is scheduled, and this rule is no longer true during its lifetime, the pod is not going to get rescheduled because of that. So this rule is ignored uh, right after the scheduling has happened. Um, and what we're telling uh, Kubernetes here is that um, if there is already a help content scheduled to a node in this in that specific zone, that's the label we're using as zones, don't schedule the pod. So what I'm simulating basically is scheduling each of the three replicas for pulp content in different Amazon zones. Um, and so let's uh, schedule that. And here in the top screen here, I'm. Uh, watching the command that shows all the pulp content pods. OK, so 
I ran that and we can see that three pulp content pods are starting. Um, they're not ready yet, um, but they should be ready uh, very shortly. When they're ready, we'll be able to go look at the at this page right here. It's the content app. Uh, we don't actually have any content in here, but it's there. So then um, what I'm going to demonstrate is that you can take a node out of service um, and drain it. So basically, re, uh, uh, and take all the pods away from that node. And we're going to show that the service, oops, uh-oh. Okay, sorry. Let me. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna cordon one of the nodes. So the when you cordon the node, you uh, tell it to no longer schedule to there, and then I'm gonna drain it. I'm going to drain this node, which is going to basically, you're going to see one of these nodes get terminated. And what I what I forgot to point out is that they were all scheduled on different nodes. <laughs> and now what we're going to have is that two of them are going to be on the same node because the rule is not required but preferred. Um, and so that's really all for the demo. Um, and we have documentation on this. Um, if you look in the pulp operator docs, you'll see how an example of this. And really, all the docs on the scheduling are here on Kubernetes docs. Um, I want to uh, give a lot of thanks to Umberto for helping me uh, put together the demo and for the idea for the presentation. So thank you, Umberto. Now I'm ready for all your questions. Yes, Ina. Um, so what it's doing here, it makes sure that the customer store definition, which is there, it's always like reconciling the loop, right? That if something goes down, it makes sure that it matches the number three. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, this is a bit different from, uh, and I don't know whether operator can do it as of today, or if it cannot, do you know if there are any plans to scale up and down based on the workloads? Uh, the operator does not do this now. Um, we have discussed that it's possible that we'll do that in the future. And um, this open telemetry metrics that we're going to be gathering will probably be useful to making decisions like that um, for the operator. But right now, we don't actually have this on our roadmap. It's a, a very long-term goal. <laughs> Thank you. That seems like the open telemetry will be hand in here, right? Oh, the for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the open telemetry uh, work is really going to help us set these uh, service level objectives. Um, and then we're going to use the metrics from open telemetry as those indicators. Grant? Yeah, actually, you just, you pretty much just said I was going to say, or I've seen other projects use it. You need the telemetry, you need the data to make the decisions like I'm running out of CPU, I'm running out of disk, I'm running out of memory. Uh, this pod is up, but it hasn't, it isn't, doesn't seem to be doing anything. Once you have the data, there's a lot of cool things you can do in operator land, but the, the data has to be there first to be able to start making decisions. Um, which is why I'm very excited about the work that, uh, that Decker was showing us yesterday. Yep. 
I just want to say that we would be interested in that as well because we try to scale up. But I think we're just doing it on resources. Um, but we'd also like to look at things like how many tasks are in the queue. I guess we could get already from the API, though. Yeah, but it's yep, it's not the same, right, David? Like, yeah, because you don't know whether those tasks are waiting for a single resource or they're waiting because they don't have a worker yet. It would be interesting, David, I'm going to pick on you here for a second. It would be really interesting to me to uh, see the kinds of things that you would like to make decisions on be a discussion somewhere, because that'll help us prioritize how we um, uh, allocate people to um, adding probes and the, the you know gathering that kind of information as opposed to just scattershot we're going to do things that we think are reasonable, but especially those of you all that are doing active uh, production systems at scale, you all know way better the kinds of things that are actually useful as opposed to the kinds of things that are theoretically useful. I'd love to see that discussion start up somewhere. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, some things I would need to think about and get back to you on, but yeah, maybe I can make a list or something. If you do such a thing, um, just throw up a thread on discourse would be great. And then we could get more eyes and get lots of, uh, you know, some brainstorming happening. Cool, I'm taking that as a to do, so. Happy to volunteer you any day, David, thank you. <laughs> uh, Brian? Brian? Yep, software mute. Um, hey, great demo. Uh, about the worker metrics, um, that is one of the parts of this epic that we have planned, um, which uh, just um, a discourse is a great idea. Don't want to take away from that. Um, this is a ticket that is the one that we're going to be using to implement those worker uh, metrics on as well. Um, so just wanted to share that. Uh, the question I had about the demo was, um, so these are in different availability zones, which sounds right from an HA perspective. Um, how, but the database isn't in different availability yeah. zones. Yeah. And, and well, we said I, it's highly available. So that's, I'm taking that as a given. How, how does the WAN, are these spanning WAN connections? How, how, how is, how do these services work? I guess, I, I guess I'm, I don't run a lot of production services yet, but I am having trouble imagining, like, aren't these high latency connections when they're in different availability zones? And how do their database connections reach back in a way that's reasonable? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, I don't know either, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> And, and I guess, um, David, uh, if, um, feel free to decline this <laughs> question, but I was, I, after watching what we saw yesterday, um, which we won't go too much into, uh, do, do you guys have any connection issues with distributing content in multi geos or in, in, in different availability zones and connecting um, back to the database? Like, what's that like? So yeah, so once the edge node um, makes the request to pull up, it stores like the package for a year. So pretty much like our, we're mirroring everything in different availability zones. So we don't really have many connection problems. The ones we do have are specific to like different regions. Like in China, you know, there's the great firewall that slows traffic and stuff like that. But yeah, we haven't had too many issues serving content. Um, we have had some issues with like, uh, publishers like publishing like hundreds of packages within like an hour, you know, that sort of thing. Um, we, we've increased um, the scale size, like how much the pods scale up. And that seems to have resolved that issue. Um, we are seeing a lot of database traffic, but that's mostly when publishers are publishing content. Um, but we haven't had too many problems distributing that. What was your other question, by the way? Because you asked, I was I was reading through the ticket that you um, pasted. 
Oh, about the ticket? Yeah, you asked some other question about how you probe, I think. Um, no, more more just trying to connect. Um, no, just more advertising that ticket. Okay. Cool. Um, and uh, a discourse also sounds like a great place for a discussion too. Just wanted to call out um, that ticket because that's what we're going to use to track the adding wh whatever metrics we do come up with together. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can post on the ticket. That sounds good. Um, you know, you have your hand up, but I guess one, I wanted one like little follow up. Um, so when these, when these, for David, when these nodes are in different regions, do they connect back to one database? Um, yeah, well, so they connect to pulp content, right? They reverse proxy requests to pulp content. And then once they get the content and they actually pulp, like if it's a package request, pulp will redirect to object storage. And then the edge node, which is just a VM running Nginx, will cache. We have like terabytes worth of space. They'll just cache the request, the package, or what have you, for like a year. So. Oh, OK, cool. So this explains, cool. So the database connections don't cross the availability nope. zone. <laughs> they yeah. connect back via a reverse proxy and then provide caching. Yeah. The, the one thing that might be nice is if we had some way to push the content instead of waiting for the first request, if we could push the, the content to the CDN. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to, uh, our next presentation is deals with that a little bit, but we'll get into that in the next presentation. Um, uh, thanks a whole bunch, both of you. Again, great, great presentation, Dave, uh, Dennis. Thanks. Enough. Um, I just quickly wanted to follow up. Uh, Brian's question about uh, how do we handle the database connections from the nodes which are in different zones. I, I think the original intention doesn't solve this uh, and I think it wouldn't be solved unless it would be a clustered uh, database deployment. I think the original intention in this case was mostly to not hold the eggs in one basket so you deploy the replicas in different um, zones in case like one node goes down in one zone, you don't lose all the replicas. That's why you have that rule set as the anti-pod affinity or whatever was its name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. anti-affinity. Um, exactly. I think you uh, put it well when you said don't put all your eggs in one basket. And in this case, don't put all your replicas on a single node. <laughs> um, spread the no, uh, the replicas across nodes. Because nodes do get taken down for service. It's not just like, you know, unexpected disruptions, you know, just, yeah. Anyway, thank you for the summary, you <laughs> know. Dennis, thank you very much for the talk. Um, any last questions or I suggest you have a break. Perfect, I'm stopping the recording.